you know, the last night as I was watching the different uh, election returns and, and seeing what's going on, and the Lord says, you know, um, a lot of people have worked really hard to bring about the remnant of the body of Christ into coming into an understanding. And he said, but a lot of times they just like their own accolades. They just go, you know, look what we did. You hear me? Look what we did. We, we just got everybody out to vote and they all did their thing. And he said to me, he said, but I need them to see me do it. And I said, yeah. To recognize that it's me. Okay. It's not some tons of other people. Pats on your back, you know, like, oh, wow, we did this great thing. And he said, so, he said, I want you to uh, realize that this is my test to the body of Christ. This is my test to see where were the mouth and their faith line up. Right now, right in this moment yeah. of decision. And what will they do? What will they do? Will they say, ah, we did all this and you didn't show up? Exactly. Or will they have the faith to let me do the miracles mm-hmm. that I plan on doing? And so when I was sitting there and he said, do you remember Elijah? And I go, oh, yes, you never let me forget Elijah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a prophet's life is really hard. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was way past hard because, you know, you died if you didn't get things right and stuff like or that. Even if you didn't. Huh? Or even if you did. Or even if you did, you died. Yeah, hello. There was a whole big whatever. <clears throat> but but what I realized is, you know, some of the physical prophetic signs they would... You remember those crazy things they would make them do? Yes. Lay on your side for so long and eat this stuff and ugh. Eat down and all yeah, yeah, all this stuff. Okay. I just praise God we're past that. <laughs> you didn't even get that part? Oh, yeah. Never mind being a prophet. Yeah, you just don't. I mean, you know, you had to either be. If I could just change my mind about prophet. Prophet. <laughs> but now we get to be prophetic in the redeemed sense. So, But the prophetic signs are still there. And the prophetic interpretation of what he wants you to do is still there. So a lot of times what we don't realize is that uh, he's asking us to prophetically walk something out, and it's uncomfortable. We don't like it. Um, we're not real sure, you know, that we don't want people to think we're crazy, you know. Uh, I can remember when he started first making me do things, and I'd say, but what will they think? He goes, what do we care? <laughs> and I had to really um, kill, if you will, <laughs> My desire to be a people pleaser, my desire to, you know, make me look good even if I'm acting crazy. I need to pretend, well, you know, God just makes me do these silly little things, you know. And he goes like, no, you say, I have to do this. Okay, it's a difference in your attitude and the actions that you come. And <clears throat> first time he made me give a word to somebody, a total stranger. I was like, Lord, Lord, Lord. And he goes, you don't even know him. <laughs> You're right. I'll never see him again. I'll just say what you need to say. But he was working me up to the place where I would be obedient no matter what it looked like in the natural. You've all been there. You've all experienced that to some degree. But I want to read you just as a refresher what was really going on with Elijah. And most of you know that um, that's one of the core things that HAPN has done is we recognized immediately when Dutch and several other of the major uh, apostles and prophets of the nation started talking about that the ruling demon, the ruling principality like that, is Baal. And it was the strong man over America. And there are lots of other powers and different things that are working with that power. But it was that thing that we were married to. I need to say it like that. We did not realize we were married to Baal. We didn't realize that what we were doing, our covenants that we were making, um, you know, just 
for example, like Freemasonry, you know, we just did the huge Deliverance Prayer Sunday for Freemasonry for a lot of people. <clears throat> and you don't realize that if you are in Masonry, you are married to Baal. So you, we just don't think like that. Uh, other things like mindsets or beliefs. Um, if I had kept all the mindsets that I was trained with in college, those mindsets were Baal mindsets in their simplest form. And I would have been agreeing forever with those mindsets. So in essence, I would have been married to Baal. Even though I'm a professing Christian, even though eventually I got spirit-filled, I would have still been, you see, parts of me in agreement or alignment with Baal. And you cannot worship too. And so when that mixture starts in, then the enemy gets a lot of play to come in and minister to you and to mess with you and bring calamity to you and do all these different things. <clears throat> so what he reminded me is that's what HBN is doing for many, many years now. We actually have a divorce decree for bail because we, we have recognized that it's a legal thing that as long as Baal has a legal piece of you, he can come and minister to you. He's allowed to bring his demons to minister to you. He's allowed to bring his inheritance to you. Well, in looking at America, that's what we were assigned to do. And so we literally began the remnant part of going to all 50 states and divorcing Baal, going to all the capitals and divorcing Baal, going, I can't tell you how many countless times to all these different places to divorce Baal. We went to all the Masonic lodges. We went to every abortion clinic. Are you hearing me? That's a lot of places. Let me just assure you right up front. And this last year, we took, we did the next step in the religion of that. Um, we went to all the Mormon temples. Okay. As, as a group, divorcing Baal again. But we're not doing it because we're against them. Hear me. It's our brothers and sisters in Christ a lot of times that are captured in those different places. And so what God was sharing with me this morning is <clears throat> this is the point where Elijah was confronting the Baal prophets. Okay. So I just want to read this to you. And... Uh, Let me get to this spot. Um, this is 1 Kings 18. And uh, it's this is the part where it's starting on the Mount Carmel. It's verse 20. So Ahab, who everybody knows is married to Jezebel. Jezebel. <laughs> okay. And the reason that's her name is because she is a Baal worshiper in the female. And it's always the same thing. Okay. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, he wasn't taking in consideration what we call the Jezebel prophets, or which some say were equal in number. So that's how many would have been there. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other oxen, lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, well, that's a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself and prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And then they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and they called on the name of Baal from the morning until noon saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. 
and they leaped about the altar which they made. In other words, this is the beginning thing, so you will see in almost all of the uh, occultic religions, there's a lot of dance. Now, remember, dance is not evil, but there's a lot of dance where the spirits come and empower them. Okay, so when they dance and worship, because that's an original uh, worship to God, is to dance before him. When they come and do it in the perversion of it, then the spirits are allowed to enter them and they transcend different dimensions and they can actually manifest as different things. They can manifest as different um, demons, as different animals, different everything else. So you got to realize that's what they were invoking. The sound of movement and dance, which is what we're supposed to use in worshiping God. He can't create anything. He can just pervert what is created. So they leaped about the altar which they had made. <clears throat> and it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a God. Either he's occupied, which another translation says he's on the toilet. <clears throat> That's what he was inferring to them. Okay. Either he's occupied or he's gone aside or is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and he needs to be awakened. So he's mocking <laughs> their God. Do you understand? He's mocking. And, and in so many ways, in this last season, that's what's been happening. Is we've been saying, hey, our God is God. Our God is that, doing what he needs to do. Where is your God? Where is he? Okay, <clears throat> so they cried with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. Because remember, blood is the covenant sign. When you and I take communion, we are cutting covenant. We are saying we're exchanging blood is what we're doing. And so they were doing the perverse of this. This is why if you have anybody that's dealing with cutting, how many of you have had different people in your lives that were cutters? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is a specific uh, sacrifice that they don't even realize it. They don't even realize what's happening. But when they cut themselves, they are literally offering their blood to that demonic thing that's tormenting them. But instantly, they will get relief. Are you hearing me? Now, physically, we know that what happens is the body goes, Oh my gosh, we've been cut. <laughs> Do something. Kick out some hormones. Kick out some painkillers. We have been cut. That's what your body will do. So it'll actually give them a rush of, of things. But what happens in the spirit realm is they have just cut covenant with Baal. Okay, and so we've lost that. <clears throat> so they're cutting themselves and doing all this stuff. Have we not seen that this, this year? An increase. Notice the violence. Mm -hmm. Notice that it's always, they always need blood. Notice we're after stopping abortion. They always need blood. Notice how those things go. So I said when midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. <clears throat> so this is all day. Okay, they've done this all day. They've been at it all day long. How many of you would have gone to the all-day worship cer ceremony? You know what I'm saying? All day they did this. And he just sat there and let them do their things, and let them do whatever. But it's coming up to the new day. Mm -hmm. See, evening is when the new day starts. Mm -hmm. So it's coming up to that moment where, well, I've let you play all day long. But now we're about to change regimes. We're about to bring in God's miracles. We're about to shift it to a whole new place. And that's what was happening. So, 
So, but no one was paying attention to them. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. That's where you are right now. In this moment. He's saying, come near to me. The prophets have yelled. The prophets of Baal have shown you what they're going to do. The prophets have laid out what they want to do. They've done everything they can. And it looks like all day, you know, with 450 of them, that's a lot of blood and dancing and, you know, everything else. It looked like they were going to succeed. But then he said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Huge piece. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he, re he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And you have to understand, the alt he had to repair it because that altar had been destroyed. That altar, the one that the Baal prophets are using is not the same altar. I mean, I had one, I've heard several pastors go, it was the same thing. He just, no, 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 no. It was a separate altar that they had for Baal. And this one he made different. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and he cut the ox into pieces. You do realize this is labor intensive, <clears throat> right? Have y'all ever been around cutting up animals? <laughs> you can't just use your little pocket knife, okay? You gotta do some serious hacking. <laughs> And I tell them the truth, bet that you are. And it's such a wonderful smell too, isn't it? Yes, okay. All these things. <laughs> so think about this. He arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Okay. I heard this when we were at, I think, the conference. I can't remember now who even said it. But do you realize why this was such a big deal to pour water on it? We're all thinking in terms of, well, it'll keep the fire from going. No, they were in a drought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The most precious thing they had was water. Mm -hmm. Do you see the unbelievers? See, we missed that piece. The most precious thing they had was water. So when he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood, that was a huge sacrifice because they're in drought. They don't have water. And then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. <laughs> I think that's what we're seeing right now. It's like God saying, okay, pour everything you got out on this election. Pour it all out. But what's he asking the body of Christ to do? Lay your sacrifice on it. Okay. Because when we doubt, when we have unbelief, that's when the enemy gets to come in and capture us. When we look at all these 450 prophets of Baal dancing around, cutting themselves, declaring victory in any form of fashion, what do we end up doing? Coming into agreement with them. So, the water flowed around the altar, and he also said, fill the trench with water. Okay, so we're all seeing this. It's all saturated, super, super saturated. Okay, so it's like no one can say, well, he actually accidentally struck a match and threw it in there when they were doing that. And that's what happened. It wasn't really God. You see what I'm saying? This is a case where there is no doubt who's doing it. 
I mean, even with these bales. Now, remember, these are the same bales that have access to those miracles, just like Pharaoh's prophets. They have access to that occult realm. They can pull snakes and miracles out of everything. But it wasn't happening. And he did it. So at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, new day, Elijah the prophet came near and this was his prayer. And he said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Can we not pray that for today? So we say, Father, on this day, November the 4th, which is the day after, I don't know how many of you even know this, Chesfon 17 was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Chesfon 17 was the day that God broke up the deep waters for Noah and the flood. Are you hearing that? That's the day he broke up the deep so that he could wipe out the evil. Are you getting that? That was yesterday. (laughs) This is today. Today we say, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and in the United States and that we are your servants. We are the remnant of the Most High King and we have done all these things at your word. So answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, which is normal, and the wood, which is normal, and the stones, which is not so normal, and the dust, which is not so normal, and it licked up the water that was in the trench, which is definitely not normal, right? Mm -hmm. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and he slew them there. Okay. So, (laughs) that's what the Lord woke me up with this morning. I go, well, let's just start off straight, you know, really hard right off the bat. And he said, you know, what would bring revival? We can all have fancy words and we can all have Holy Spirit coming and dropping his, his presence into our sanctuaries. But is that going to bring revival? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I have a feeling all those people that were watching this exchange kind of had a fire for revival. Wouldn't you think? I mean, if you saw the fire come down like that mm-hmm. and eat up the stones, I mean, think about it. They've passed all the stuff they think is normal. Even if it had eaten the wood and the animal, fire doesn't eat water. It could eat some paper ballots. It could eat some paper ballots. (laughs) That's exactly my point. You see, we limit God because we're using the wrong definitions of what he can do for a miracle. Do you think if they put machines and paper ballots and absentee ballots. You think if they create them and they're evil and God comes in and says no, they won't disappear? Had you thought of that? See, we are sitting here listening to the prophets of Baal cut themselves, yell and scream and holler, but are we hearing what Elijah said? How do miracles just happen like that? Well, we walk into the dimensions where they do. We walk into the place where we get to the place where we say, well, if God wants to burn up the stones, he can do that because he's gone. So 
The other thing I'm hearing him saying today is that for this to be and have the full power of what he's wanting, we must extend our faith. You and I have faith for a lot of things. And a lot of times we like to say, I have faith for something, but it's really, you don't need any faith for that because you already have it. If you're standing in the light, you don't really need faith to know that the light is on. Do you hear me? You don't need faith for that. If you're standing in the darkness and you don't have any accessible light, You need faith to navigate the darkness. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. That's how your faith muscles get extended and exercised and grow stronger. It's because he puts you in positions where in the natural, it even sounds crazy to voice it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Even sounds crazy to voice, well, of course we want. Because all these others are saying a different story. All the stats. All the 450 prophets. Mm. But for us to get to the place, and God needs to show off, I think you need to understand that. He needs to show off in such a way they gasp. They gasp. Oh my goodness, the fire just destroyed the voting machines and the paper ballots. I don't know. Do you hear what I'm saying? That they just, it's not a question. Then that brings revival. Because we have so many, you know, that's the thing that most people don't recognize is we've often called it silly things like the democratic machine. Okay. They can make anything happen. I've had a lot of people tell me that. Says, well, you went up against the democratic machine and you don't understand the evil or the what. And I go, well, whatever. I'm just not going to give them that much credit. But when you realize who's empowering a lot of that to bring the agenda, then you recognize what's shifting and changing. So, what does God tell us to do today? He gives us a lot of instruction in Ephesians chapter 6 about how to do spiritual warfare. That's kind of the basic chapter on spiritual warfare in the scripture. I would say we're in spiritual warfare. I'm just taking a guess here. (laughs) We are against seen and unseen, known and unknown. And because of that, we are trying to figure it out in our minds what's going on and and what we need to do. But in the scripture... It's really interesting. If you go to Ephesians 6, let me just um, read this to you. Because he's saying to do that today. Um, It's talking about, especially starting with verse 10 about the armor of God. And he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I don't personally believe we take our armor off and put it on. I believe it is a continuing layer that comes onto us. Um, I've talked many times about the upgrading your armor so that you realize it's supposed to be part of your DNA. Okay, When you start picking up the pieces of the armor of God, they literally become... His DNA becomes your DNA. So you actually increase it and increase it and increase it till at some point we look like Jesus in our armor. So when they look at us, they see Jesus. They don't see us. But what we're notorious for doing is staying out on the front lines too long and getting worn down, taking on causes and not letting him come and refresh us. Uh, to where they bring us down to such an ultimate low, it's like we're going to need life support just to bring us back to any kind of happy Christianity. (laughs) Do anybody hear me on this? Because we think we're being holy, and we think we're being sacrificial because we've stayed in the fight. Do you hear what I'm saying? We've stayed in the fight when we're at the front lines. No soldier stays at the front of the battle 
24-7 for months and years. They have to come off that front line and let someone else uh, take their place for a while and get the rest they need and go back. That's why God built in the Sabbath rest. It's because if you battle all seven days, which that's what gets most of us into trouble, if we battle all seven days, we don't take that rest, then we're not strengthened in by his armor. We're not strengthened to do it. So <clears throat> it says, for your struggle is not against flesh and blood. Okay. Um, I think that's hard for some of us to understand. And let me, let me just get to this one place. <clears throat> the word uh, struggle, and in some uh, versions it's called wrestle, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not struggle against flesh and blood. Some will say we do not do hand-to-hand -hand combat with flesh and blood. But the word for that <clears throat> is the word pali. And pali literally means, it can mean the form of wrestling like we think of it in the natural, but it's from, uh, it's a noun, okay? It's not a verb. Do you consider wrestle a noun? Is, is uh, struggle a noun? You see, this word is a noun. This, this Greek word is a noun. And what it means, it comes from the root word, which means to vibrate. H hear me. It means to vibrate. So what it's es es in essence saying to us, and this is the only place it's used in the New Testament. There is no other time this word is used in the New Testament. One time in this chapter, saying we do not struggle, we do not wrestle, we do not vibrate against flesh and blood. Who are we vibrating against? Well, according to this, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So when we take up our armor so that you will be able to rest in, resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded yourself with this. So it gives a different picture, doesn't it? When you're sitting there going, we're thinking we're wrestling demons, we're taking our swords out, we're doing all this stuff. But what it's saying is to stand there and vibrate. What are you vibrating? You're in essence resounding the sound of God. Mm -hmm. So when the sound of God is in you, you become a pillar that resounds like the relay stations that resound things in the, in the air, in the airways. They hear it here, and they resound it, and it goes here, and they resound it, and it goes here. That's what we are. We are saying, God, fill our sound up with your sound. His sound would be the sound of glory. His sound would be the sound of love. His sound would be the sound of peace. His sound would be the sound of joy. And he says, when we resound that sound, in essence, it's giving permission via Holy Spirit, for all the angel armies to come in and take out the enemy in that sound. Mm. See the difference? Because we're fighting against these spiritual things. We can't even see them. I mean, how many of you really see them? I mean, I see some things every once in a while, but it's more like impressions. I don't actually see the demonic entity. Now, sometimes they let me see it just because they want to scare the ever-loving daylights out of me, you know, to get that, well, look what you're up against. And then I just ask God to do the sci-fi thing and shrink them, okay, so then I can deal with them. <clears throat> but do you hear the difference on what this is saying? So today we are up against all those things that were listed there in Ephesians 6. The principalities, the powers of the air, the evil, the darkness. We're up against all of those. Because this election has nothing to do with a person being in office. 
This election has to do with fighting the good fight of faith and saying, just as Elijah did, if this is God, then worship that. But if God is God, worship that. And God has got to bring in this miracle so that he can resound through us what he wants to do. So here we are standing on this place where in the scene, we just don't see a lot of ways that God can do miracles. Well, I don't think anybody thought that one man against 450 could do any either. So we have a choice. What are you vibrating? In essence, it's the same type of thing that Holy Spirit was doing over the deep waters. Do you remember? In the very beginning, he was vibrating. He was hovering, saying, this is what you're going to be. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. God's about to shift that so that I can have the building blocks to build creation. Yesterday was the day he broke up the deep waters. Are you getting that? That's so huge. So huge. And not many people are even getting it. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, I was reading, I, I read a couple times in the, more than a couple times, but in the New uh, Testament where it talks about, um, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it, there's two ways that it happened, like in Noah's day that came from above and from the deep. You know, it broke up from the deep. Both places. And in the last days it says, I believe that the deep waters that are in us are being broken that are in you know and that that's going to bring forth not only are we going to have the latter rain the pouring out from above but we're here we already have holy spirit but there's deep waters in each of us that need to be released and released. broken up yes 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 well, that's such a beautiful picture because that's the two waters and that's what i hear so he can't do it to them till he's done it to us. That's right. That's you get that. So we have to, to allow the deep waters, we have to allow the things that are trapping us in evil, that are keeping our faith from not going to where it needs to. What keeps you from stepping out and saying, God is God. Now I never go around saying God is in control because I don't really think like that. I mean, I don't think it's a true statement. It's not a true statement. I'm trying to be nice, Candy. I'm trying to... I already get stuff, okay? I'm just trying to be nice. The truth is, God is in charge. Yes. That's a totally different understanding. And we still have millions of Christians that believe God is in control. So that relinquishes them from any responsibility. So when this all happens and they don't get what they want, they'll say, well, God was in control. Right. When in fact, Jesus did the finished work, we all know that, but what did he really finish? If he had finished um, not only the battle of it, if he had finished the battle and the execution of it or the verdict of it being enforced, that would have been truly Everything finished. What he finished was his part. His part was to strip Satan of any authority that he had in any of these kingdoms. That was Jesus' part. Remember that. You understand? Stripping Satan of any authority that Satan had over all these kingdoms of earth, all the people, everything. So when he did that, he could say, It is finished. I've actually stripped him of all his authority. But now, he's given those keys to those kingdoms where he stripped him of having the authority to rule in those kingdoms. He's given those keys to you and I. You and I are supposed to take the keys, which is access, because we now have authority, and to go into those kingdoms and unlock them and kick 
the devil out. Now, if we think he's just going to go out because we say, that's where our battle doesn't make sense. Because he is a worthy adversary and he will fight us back. But if we get to our faith to a level where we partner with Holy Spirit and with the angels' armies, we can literally go in and evict him from those places. Right now, the battle in America is for who still has authority over the kingdom of America. Do you see how huge that is? So it's not going to be Yolanda sticks her keys in and goes, nope, Satan, you can't do that anymore because I'm not the body of Christ. I'm just a living stone or a living cell of that body. So I must have enough of a remnant. I must have enough of the body of Christ coming into unity with the agreement and understanding that we have the legal, spiritual, and civil right to kick the enemy out of the kingdom of the United States of America. That's a lot. And when you have your own body that's saying, no, we're not even going to vote. There are, what, 320 million, something like that, people in America? I don't know the exact number. Something like that. Do you realize they don't vote? They don't vote. (laughs) I think there's something like 25, 26 million Christians that they know of that don't vote. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say today? This is where we are. We have a body of Christ that is fighting its own self. Until we come into unity in different places, we're not going to be able to evict the enemy out because we're still in agreement with him. The There's thing, still people in the body. I believe the other thing is we don't realize that we've got to occupy that place. Exactly. When we when we evict them, it's one thing to just kick them out, but we've got to occupy yeah. that spot that they mm-hmm. had. Yeah. And we... We have abdicated that for years and years and years. I I can't tell you how many people will tell me, well, I can't get involved with politics because that's evil. And I want to say to them over and over again, you know, Jesus was involved in pretty much everything. And that's your pattern. And government is part of it. And, you know, but that's the deception of the enemy. So as long as they agree, you realize they're shooting at you. You realize they're throwing darts at you. They're throwing knives. They're trying to kill you because they believe you are in wrong agreement. And I have actually had them say to me, Jesus won't come back until the United States goes to hell in a handbasket. And why would I work to stop that? Because Jesus will come back sooner. You know, it, it's those moments where I'm so glad I'm not carrying my physical gun. And I tease, but that's the angst I have, knowing that it's our very fellow brothers and sisters that are allowing it because they won't be involved. So it makes me just say one more time, I'm standing for you, I'm vibrating for you, and when I've done everything I can do, I will stand. And my favorite image of that is the Native American warrior that's on top of our capital here in Oklahoma. How many of you know that picture? Mm-hmm. He's there, he's taken a lance, and he's driven it through his leggings, okay, into the ground because he's saying, I'm taking this ground, and I'm not going to move, and if I die, I die but I'm going to be the warrior and defend it to the very end. Do you understand what an image that is? And so as he sits there with his bow and arrow getting ready to do that, he's adhered himself. He's glued himself. Volved himself. That's a good way. Volved himself saying, I will take this stand. Whether I live or die. Can we say that today? How many Americans 
are moaning right now that have fought so hard and done so thought and all they're doing is seeing the negative. You can't do that. Live or die. I will stay the fight. I will stand and I will vibrate with the sound of God, letting and releasing the angel armies. I so often think people don't grasp that the body of Christ is not just here on earth. It's not just the ones that are alive right now. The body of Christ are even those that are saints in heaven right now. And we keep thinking it's just us. No, 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 no. The body of Christ is in different dimensions. Some are in heaven and some here on earth. But you get to partner with all those people you read about in the scripture. Amen. They're the body of Christ. The men and women of faith, they're, they're yes. working with us. Yes. Okay, and we keep, you know, thinking, oh, it's just me. I'm the only, it's like Elijah. He's, I'm the only one left. Yeah. There's nobody else. It's just me, right? It was after. And that was after. <laughs> but think about that. So I want you to realize that when we stand and resound that sound, when we vibrate with that sound, we are partnering with the body of Christ that does understand. We are partnering with the saints, the bandstand of witnesses. We are partnering with Holy Spirit. We are partnering with Jesus' finished work. And we are partnering with the angel armies of God and Lord Sabaoth, who's in charge of timing and who's in charge of bringing everything into alignment like the stars. So today, we should be rejoicing. Amen. Yes. Instead of lamenting. <laughs> okay. Rejoicing that seen or unseen, known or unknown, when we vibrate, when we do that, we take a different stand for God. So <clears throat> he's challenged me today to realize that he is in charge and that he knows what's about to happen more than we do and that he doesn't have to think up a miracle. They just happen. We're still in the dimensions where we're trying to conjure up a miracle. Do you hear He's in the dimension where there is no conjuring because that happens all the time. To God, it's not a miracle. It's just him breathing. It's just him vibrating. To us, it's a miracle because we didn't live in that place. We don't live in the place where fire burns up stone. But did you know we're supposed to? The Lord says we are. So today you have an opportunity to increase your faith. Mm -hmm. You have an opportunity to hear the sound of God rather than the sounds of man. To hear the sound of God rather than the sounds of the prophets of Baal. Today you have that opportunity. And if you will do it, what he will do is what he's always promised he will do. Because our training is to take back what the enemy has stolen. When we get those kingdoms pretty much all sewed up, I think that's when he comes back. Because it says that he's wanting to make us one. In John 17, doesn't he say, Father, I've done all my stuff. Now I want you to make them one as you and I are one. So we're making this one so that we, as the body of Christ, do our training, get the enemy kicked out, and we're standing there as a glorious, victorious bride, which is what Ephesians 5.27 says. He's wanting a glorious bride that is without spot or wrinkle who can overcome anything. Do you see her yet? Not so much. It starts with us. It starts with us. It starts with us saying... I choose to do that. Live or die. I'm putting my vav in the ground. I'm lancing myself 
to the kingdom of God. Think of what he says. Seek ye first what? Does it say seek ye first Jesus? That's, we all miss that. How many times do we say that in our head? Who is the access to the kingdom of God? Jesus. But that's not what he's saying for you to seek. Because he rules and reigns in that place. place. But he's wanting us to seek via him and Holy Spirit. But he says specifically, he didn't say, seek ye first Jesus. Did he? He didn't say that. But see how we twist it? Because we'll tell it, if you just hunt after Jesus, everything else will be fine. Well, not unless you do the spiritual exchange and say, here's my garbage, Jesus. Now give me your good stuff. I, can, I have lots of people that seek after Jesus. They memorize his word. They do all that. But they don't exchange anything in themselves for what he's wanting to give to them. They just become someone that hides out and waits for him to return. But he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is a whole different meaning in that he's trying to teach us when we see what the kingdom of God looks like, then we know what we're supposed to be bringing here. It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you don't know what his kingdom looks like, how do you know what you're bringing? How do you know what you're bringing? You're just going to bring your version of the kingdom. Okay. My version of the kingdom is probably not like your version. All of us have our own little, you know. But if we seek what does his version of the kingdom of God look like and understand that, then we can see how when we take back the authority and we go in and we kick the enemy out, then we'll know what to replace it with the kingdom of God. But just like Candy's saying, too many times we have fought a battle and then when we won it and and had that victory, we left. And the enemy just waited seven days and came right back in. I've seen it happen in government and everywhere else. You've seen it in churches and everywhere else. We get a certain victory, but we don't occupy it. We don't maintain it. We don't have people that recognize that's what they're doing. So as the body of Christ, this is our challenge. This is our day to say, take us out of this dimension. Put us in the dimension where we come into agreement with the kingdom of God that says he will bring the fire on the new day. He will bring the fire and burn it up. And we've got to be ready to address those prophets of Baal. It says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But until you get rid of the demonic things that are in them, they will fight against you. When you get rid of that, then you can rescue the humans. That's what I see. I see a lot of times, and I've shared that with you before. I was watching one of the um, battles where Antifa had come in and all this stuff. And God just really highlighted me to this one particular person. And he said, pray for him. And I go, Psh. you know, he's throwing things, beating up people. <laughs> what would you like me to pray? That he dies? I mean, what, what would you like me to pray? I'm just being honest here. Be specific. Be specific. <laughs> and he said, well, for his soul. And I go, you can see God. <laughs> he goes, yeah, but I love him. And he said, he's supposed to be one of my prophets. But the enemies captured him. So set him free. And that's when I pray. The sin is forgiven on him. The sin is remitted off him. And however the enemy has used him as a puppet and done all that stuff to him, I say, uh-uh, cutting it off. So that he can hear what a true God is. And I just thought, oh my goodness, that's crazy. But that's what God wants us to do. So I don't wrestle against him. I wrestle, I struggle, I vibrate, I resound the sound of God against the demonic things, loosing the humans so that then God can come in and speak to them. Okay?
So let me seal this up today. Father God, I thank you that you are still on the throne. And that you have a purpose and a plan for all things. And that you have requested us to come into agreement and alignment and do everything you've asked us to do specifically for this election. We have repented. We have forgiven. We have come together in worship. We've declared and decreed. We've commanded the heavens. We've done everything that we have been told to do to the best of our understanding and knowledge. So, Father, we ask for grace and mercy that we can stand resounding so that the miracle that needs to happen from you is allowed to happen because we didn't step and take its place. And we didn't allow the enemy to steal, kill, or destroy. So, Father, we thank you that you have a purpose and a plan and that you're never too late and that you always do it so you get the glory. So we come into agreement with this day, you getting the glory in such a way, not a man, not a team, but you get the glory in such a way to show off and show the world, if you be God, you worship this. If the Baals be God, you worship that. And today we know that you get the glory. And we thank you for tearing up the deep, we thank you for just pulling it apart so it will flood out. Amen. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.